Revelation chapter 19. I love this chapter. It's so exciting. There's activity all over the place. There seems to be conflict resolved. We've been looking for the last few weeks at war and the waging of war, and now it seems to be over. I look forward to the day when the construction here in the neighborhood is over. I don't know if that ever really will happen, but the last few days, it seems to have been more oppressive than the noise. The people are lovely. Construction guys are great, but the noise is so oppressive, I actually had to close the doors today just so I could hear myself think, and I don't think too loudly. But it, it was an oppressive sound. But at 5 o'clock, it just stopped in like, like a moment, and there was a hush on the neighborhood that was so delightful. And I don't know if you've experienced battles in the sense of fighting with your parents or fighting with your children, fighting with government or fighting with a policeman or all of the above at once if your father's a policeman in government. But if, if all of that is true, there is a moment at the end of a war when it's calm, at the end of state of origin, when it's all over and all the people have left the stands, there's calm. But the idea that I want you to get is when the war is over, and when the parades are over, there's a real calm in your own existence. And when John is writing to the believers, and he's looked and I heard another thing, and I saw another thing. He does a lot of this, uh, verse 1, I heard something like a loud voice. He says that several times. I saw something like, he says many other times. So what he sees and what he hears, and those are phrases that you're going to see both in this Revelation, as well as in First John, the epistle, what you've seen and heard pass on to others. Seeing and hearing are important phrases to him because John was an eyewitness of Yeshua. He was there and walked with Yeshua. So he's always saying, I saw it, I heard it, trust me, I was there. So he's saying that that same Yeshua whom I saw back when I was a teenager, I heard another thing, I saw another thing. He calls himself to the witness stand as a verifier, which I think is beautiful. And so the calm then ends in some almost implosive hallelujah. Hallelujah, which is this explosive thank you, God, for everything. You are worthy of praise. Mm -hmm. But what is praise except you've got worth that I don't have. You've got worth that the world doesn't have. You've got worth... The world wants to give me all this nonsense, but praise God because hey, you're better than all that. That is a great feeling of comparison. It's almost like not even worthy to be compared. He's so much more glorious, so much more praise worthy. So hallelujah is this natural thing. Now, when you go to a congregation which sings hallelujah songs, make sure when you sing hallelujah, you have a reason for each hallelujah you say. Praise God, for he is worthy to be praised. Verse 1, salvation and glory and power belong to him. So there's a rationale for our emotional love. That's a good thing to do. Praise him for his excellencies. And like everything in Revelation, the numbers matter. There are three reasons, salvation, glory, and power belong to God. There are either three or seven. That's how many praises when we talk about God. Verse 2, because his judgments are true and righteous. Isaiah says that. But look what, uh, keep your finger there and go to 2 Kings chapter 9. And you'll see why this is picked up by John. Chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. Obviously the recognition of the same spirit is happening here in Revelation. Because... We were introduced to and saw the dreadful conclusion of the whore Babylon. And she is compared to Jezebel, is clear from this citation in verse 2. He has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. This is a reference to on her Babylon, but in 2 Kings 9, it's on her Jezebel. The evil one who tries to get Israel to walk away from God. 
That's it. And that's been a theme throughout the book of Revelation that the enemy, called sometimes Sodom, sometimes Egypt, sometimes Edom, more often than not Babel, meaning Rome and all the anti-Messiah, the pseudo-prophets, always want to lure the people of God into worship of themselves, their own ideas, and away from the plan and covenants of God. So that he uses this phrase, he has avenged the blood of his bondservants, means the war is over. No more fighting. When was it concluded? We'll see in just a moment. A second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Again, that's the idea of the avenging of the blood of all the servants. The 24 elders, that's the comprehensive group of all believers. So four times six, four meaning comprehensive everybody, six all humans, uh, summed up in the elders, meaning the leaders of the community of faith, 12, if you will, tribes, 12, if you will, apostles. So the Older Testament and the Newer Testament, juntos, and you get the entire community of faith represented. We've seen it before in chapter 7, we see it again now. 24 elders representing all Jews and non-Jews who love Yeshua. And the four living creatures, again the idea of four meaning universal, everything that's alive that loves Yeshua falls down and worships God who sits on the throne and they say, Amen, and now the third, Hallelujah. So there's nobody being left out of this praise to God. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you fear him, both small and great. This sounds exactly like the Psalms. Verses 1 to 4 sounded like it was calling people in heaven to praise him. But now this one in verse number 5 sounds like it's calling people on earth to praise him. And if everybody in heaven and on earth is praising him, there's no one left out. This is the result of the conquest of the woman and the false prophet. When that battle was over, all people should sing praise to God. Whenever that battle is concluded. Verse 6, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude. Verse 1, I heard something like a loud voice. Verse 5, I heard a voice came from the throne. You know, there's something about it that if you've, you're 80 years old, like John here, and you walked with Yeshua, and you're having an apocalyptic episode or 10 or 50, that's all right. I don't think John heard voices all his life. I think this is a moment in time that's not representational of his whole life, but is so stunningly uh, major that it became the final book of the Bible. We, we know that if we read it, we get a blessing. It's the book. Verse 6, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, meaning it wasn't the voice of a great multitude, but something like it, which could also be like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. So whatever these sounds were, they're saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let's rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Tell me what's wrong with that sentence. It's clear from the nickname of Messiah that something's wrong in verse 7. Why the Lamb? He's also called something else. He's the lion. See, if he's the lamb, then he's the suffering one who's dying. If he's the lion, he's the conquering one who just beat up on the harlot and put all things right under his feet. It should be the marriage of the lion who's conquered and won. But how did he win? By dying for us. And how does the bride make herself ready in the blood of the lamb? So it's a gorgeous picture. To call it the marriage of the lamb and not the marriage of the lion. Naturally, we'd say the lion would be married, the conquering hero, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We've heard him called that before. But now he's the lamb who's marrying the bride because she has made herself ready. She's prepared herself to get married to the lamb in the blood of the lamb. In the sacrifice of Yeshua, we can be made right before God. Don't miss things like that. Uh, the marriage, this whole idea of marriage is something that's customary in the whole record, not only of the Older Testament, but certainly in Jewish literature. Um, Israel is called to be the bride, or to be God's wife. Um, the Apostle Paul used the term, 
I betrothed you, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I, engaged, I made you engaged to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin. So, but the use of the idea of wife fits Jewish marriage customs because a wife engaged was a legally binding agreement. So when you get engaged, then it's as if you're married only without sex. When you do that, you become betrothed to Yeshua. And it's the same legal rights he has on you, you have on him. And now as a bride to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, and the fine linen, what is fine linen? It says it right there. It's the righteous acts of the saints. So if you want to be a good bride, then you do good stuff. And the good stuff you do is the acts of the saints. He's already appealed to these people who were martyred, right? Who've given their lives, who were beheaded, it said, for the name of God. And we live in a time where we're seeing that over and over, where people have a choice to stand up and identify with the people of God and with Yeshua himself, or to walk away and say, no, no, I, I, that wasn't me. And you think about those brothers and sisters in Kenya. I, I just cannot get away from them and how awesome they are. 150 or so students at a university, and these beheaders and murderers and savages come in and say, are you a Christian? At that point, they're saying, you have a choice. Would you like to live or die? And these believers chose the righteous acts of the saints and said, I'm going to identify with the people of God and with Yeshua who gave himself up for me, with the lamb and be washed in his blood at a moment when I have a choice to be drenched with Babel and drenched with my own self acceptance and self-congratulations instead of self-sacrifice. And they died just like that. Don't you want to applaud them? Don't you want to pray for their families? Don't you want to say, Lord, would you make me ready for such a moment like that? May it not happen that we have to choose that, but if we do, give us koyach, give us real strength that we might do that. But the righteous acts of the saints in verse 8 are much more than choosing to die when given that choice. It's choosing to die to yourself daily. It's choosing to serve other people regularly. It's choosing to take time in the Word each day. It's choosing time to pray each day and not live for myself. Last week I was going to walk just over to Westfield, and it was as if God put this old Jewish man right next to me, and we just started walking together. And I greeted him, and I said, how you doing? And we talked, and we talked. By the time we hit Westfield, which for you listening online is just 100 meters away, we were best friends. In fact, I walked him all the way to his apartment, which was on the far end of the junction. And he told me intimate details of his life and his history. I told him about things. We were best mates. And he said, by the time we got to the end, he said, so where is it you work? And I said, over there at the Jews for Jesus bookshop. He goes, oh, yeah, I've seen it said, maybe you'll come in. He said, I will. I'll stop in. We'll, have, we'll carry on our chat. I thought, how cool. Jack and I became best mates. And I helped him across the street. I didn't even know I was doing that. But he reached and grabbed my arm as we got to the corner. That's the way it's supposed to be, that you engage yourself in the lives of other people, almost unbeknownst to yourself. Those are the righteous deeds that you can do. Verse 9. Then he said, write. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper land. He only tells him to write a couple times. And so this is dictation by heaven. These are the true words of God, meaning, trust me, I'm going to tell you truth. It's kind of funny because it's in the middle of this whole truth telling. He's been very forthright, but he's saying this very stuff is really to be trustworthy. So I, John, fell at his feet to worship. He said, get up. It was very common in pagan places to bow down towards angels, but nowhere in the Bible is it acceptable. Paul was worshipped and he said to the people, get up. Uh, Peter was bowed down to in Acts 10 by Cornelius' boys, and he said, get up, I put on my toga just like you. But what does it say about Yeshua that people bowed to worship him? What did Jesus basically say of himself by receiving worship? that he was God. Yeah, he didn't say, don't, 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 don't do that. But he was actually affirming to the people who bowed down to him, you are right, I receive that. 
Because every angel would say, don't do that, just like verse 10. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Yeshua. He's saying, now worship God, the command form, worship God. Don't worship me. I, I'm like a messenger. I'm just like you. You're going to get out there and tell people. You don't want people bowing to you, Johnny. So you tell them to worship God too. Then, I love this phrase, testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. Testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. What if somebody says, I have a prophetic word. I have a prophecy. I'd like to share that with you. And you listen to it, and the name Yeshua is not in there at all. See how it can be a guard against false prophecies? Because if it's a real prophecy, a real word from heaven, somehow Yeshua is going to be central. I'm not saying every word has to be Jesus this, Jesus that. I'm saying he is the spirit of a prophecy, of a real prophecy. So when people see visions of anybody but Yeshua, and they call it prophetic, I call those demonic. Because if it's a real prophecy, Yeshua is going to be central. And you'll see that in Medjugorje and other visions of Queen Mary in Catholic circles. And Mary herself would be scandalized. The mother of Yeshua would be scandalized at the affirmation. She'd be saying, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant like you. Worship God. And not only that, but all the words that people might have at certain churches. This is a true message from heaven. Look, I saw heaven open, verse 11, and a white horse... And the one who's sitting on it is faithful and true. How many names does Yeshua get in this passage? I think four names. Faithful and true. I like that phrase. It's not just found here, but throughout the scripture. Faithful and true. Pistos and alethinos. Alethios. And it's in every language they do it, which is beautiful. So it's to be sure, verily. We wait to say the amen after we hear a prayer. But he's called Amen, or faithful, first. You can count on him before anything else. And Yeshua was the one who said, Verily, verily, I say to you, faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is a declaration of what he did do, not what he is doing. He already waged war. It's already over. He's riding the white horse, which is a picture of victory, conquest triumph. Verse 12, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. We've already seen that in the beginning of the text. Chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 18, his eyes were described just like this. And on his head are many diadems, a lot of crowns. So each of the previous bad guys had a diadem. They were ruling a little region, a little area. He's got all of them. So what that says is, you thought you were in charge? I own you. I now won. He has a name written. This is the second name. Faithful and true is his first name. Second name is a name written on which no one knows except himself. Verse 13, he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, which sounds really horrible. Let's look at Isaiah 63. I think that'll help us. Isaiah, Ishayahu. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. We'll stop there. This is Isaiah's prophecy 700 years before Yeshua. But tell me who this sounds like. The white horse fellow, and he's afflicted in all their affliction. He is saving the people. He's got his robe <clears throat> dripping with blood. I poured out their netzach, their lifeblood. It's a word that really comes from the juice of grapes, and yet it means lifeblood. So blood and grapes and wine, again, co-relate, which is always cool. And this word, whoever this is, whose own Zeroah in verse 5 brought salvation to him, He's made them drunk in his wrath. We already saw that a couple weeks ago in Revelation. And yet he's trying his best to pour out kindness. They have vengeance is in his heart. And he's looking, he's trying to see if anyone can help. Nope, I'll do it myself. And so in our world, in our understanding, Yeshua has done all this. He's Rav Lahoshia at the end of verse 1, mighty to save. And he comes to save not just the Jewish people, but all people. And he does that for everyone. And his blood stains his own, verse 3, his own raiment, his own garments are stained with his own blood. 
That's the way he takes our punishment so that we can be washed in the same blood. How awesome is that? Problem is, he became our savior, and in all their affliction, verse 9, he was afflicted. He lifted them and carried them all the days of old. His, the angel of his presence saved them. God has done all this for the Jewish people. Yet look what we did in Ma, on Mas. We rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. We turned against who Yeshua was. One by one, though, we sitting around this table and those listening online and tens of thousands globally are saying, nope, I'm on his team. And I'm letting the one whose name is a name that I cannot even be spoken be the name of my Savior. Yeah, this idea of turn to be an enemy, it's a painful one yes. for us as Jewish people. Yes. It's not easy to admit that sometimes we bring punishment on ourselves in light of or in the darkness of Yeshua turning to be our enemy. What are we supposed to do? Turn and make him our friend. Exactly right. Let's go back to Revelation. We've seen three names by the which he's called. Verse 11, faithful and true. Secondly, the name no one knows except himself in verse 12. Third, verse 13, he's called the word, word of, of God. God. So he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. There's an image right from Isaiah. And now he's called Logos, Theos, the word of God. Devar Hashem, the name of God, the word of God. What a strange name to call somebody. So everything we say about Yeshua is what we say about the Bible. And, and I, I say that to remind us that when you read the scriptures, even when you hold it, you should hold it devotionally. When you discard it from your briefcase, you should honor it in some way. You should never put another book on top of it. You should never put a book like the Bible on the floor. The way you treat the book is the way you treat Yeshua in measure. We could throw all Bibles in the ocean and it wouldn't change who he is. However, I don't recommend that we do that. The Word of God. It's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an odd nickname, but what it means is, when I say, I'll see you Tuesday, I give you my word, then I'm linking my own performance with my own promise. And if I don't show up Tuesday, then my words are fallible, and I'm not to be trusted next time I say I'll see you on Thursday afternoon. Uh, you understand? Yeah. So when God calls Yeshua his word, he's saying my promises are in him. You can count on him as much as you count on me. I give you my word, God says. All right, let's look at the fourth name by the which he's called. The armies which are, verse 14, in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. If we saw Yeshua riding on a white horse earlier, and that's a picture of victory, then these fellas, the armies, Tzvaot, because he's Adonai Tzvaot, are also triumphant. There's no battle. Battle's been won. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. We've already seen that in the text earlier, which may strike down the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron, tread the brine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. There's that phrase from Isaiah 63, yes, yes. treading the wine press alone. Verse 16, on his robe and weirdly on his thigh, he's got a name, Melech Lachim. Why on his thigh? Modern days, we say, here, give me your hand. Let's shake on it. In Bible days, let's shake on it meant if I break this, and if you break this, it's as if you castrate me. You can knock out part of my pelvic area. I am exposed. He is king over everything private and public. He's king and lord over all things covenantal. The word thigh tells me covenant. We make an agreement and I sign it, I seal it. I don't take it down to the register at some government. I take it to the register of the government in heaven, and I'm swearing by no one greater than God himself. And God is swearing by no one greater than himself that Yeshua is king of all those who think they're kings and lord of everybody who thinks they're lords. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a covenantal picture. Yeah. And robe, obviously, is a picture of royalty. So the king is not just king of Tyre or king of Sidon. He's the king of all kings. Those four titles given by John in this passage tells me a lot about him. He's faithful. He's true. He's got a name I can't even figure out. And he's the king of everybody. So in every situation, economic, political, social, personal, I can count on him. 
He's in my mystery moments. You know those times when you can't figure out anything about God? I don't even know what to pray. I'm in a mess. I'm right here. I'm at this moment, this precipice. You got a name written that I don't even know. I'm counting on you in that gap when I don't know what's going on. That is an awesome comfort. Remember, John is writing to persecuted believers, giving them the assurance of victory and comfort. You will make it. Verse 17, to the end, I saw an angel standing in the sun, crying out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds, they're vultures, that's vultures. right, and they're going to come and eat the flesh of all the bad guys. And the bad guys are not bad because they mistreat us. That would be more of the social justice system found in Amos and Hosea. But these are the bad guys who've mistreated the people of God, who've done damage to the saints. And if you do that, you will be eaten. So tit for tat, look at that, verse 18, so that you, the birds, may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. In other words, it's a comprehensive it's a, it's a picture of no one's escaping. These are the people who've mistreated the people of God. And in this day and age, he's yeah. saying that it's not just the people who whip out swords and behead people. He's saying it's people who malign the people Mod of God, modulars. who mock, who ridicule, who marginalize God's people. At the end of days, it's not going to be, oh, well, whatever you want to believe. It's going to be people in a binary situation, positive for Yeshua, negative for Yeshua. It's really the way it's going to play out. And no one will be, yeah, well, whatever. You'll have to choose to follow God or follow the pseudo-gods. Let's take the person in Sydney, okay, who doesn't believe in anything. Eventually, there'll come a time when Yeshua, Jesus, will clarify himself so much through the people of God. And people like us will be communicating to the bus driver and to the lady at Coles, etc. And people will have a choice to make. This is not for people who've never heard anything. This is for people who have heard and have chosen to go away from the plans and purposes and direction of God. If we see creation, like stand at the ocean, and just watch the water and realize you're pretty minuscule and there's got to be something bigger. You know, when you see the Blue Mountains and how immense they are, and you see yourself as tiny, and these things are awesome. You know there's somebody bigger who's created things. So really it's an acknowledgement in measure. You don't have to know everything, but you just have to give, you have to agree with the, the reality of a creator, and that's the first step. Let me finish this. So all these armies are assembled. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war. And the beast was seized. In other words, the war didn't happen. Verse 20, the beast was seized with him, the false prophet, which is just the Greek pseudoprophetes, see, who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who'd received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And they were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. That's where the phrase fire and brimstone comes from. And the rest, meaning all these bad guys, were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I saw in safari vultures and a, a, a squad of probably 250 vultures devouring an elephant. It was one of the ugliest scenes ever in Africa, in Botswana. And I'm filming this thing thinking, why in God's name am I filming this? And I'm getting a real zoom in on that vulture. And, and they're flapping and they're drying and then they're fighting each other like there's not enough meat. But this is what a picture drives home to me. These vultures, the birds flying in mid heaven, coming to eat all the dead beings who are out there, abundant. And they're fighting even over each other. But there's going to be so many who die fighting the Almighty. But the war's already over. When was the war fought? At the cross of Yeshua. When he died, the battle was over. Yeshua died victorious. It looked like failure, but we read it in Isaiah 63. He spilled their lifeblood on the earth. He poured it all out. Remember, when they pierced his side on the cross, what came out? Water and blood. Water and blood. He was asphyxiated. It was a proof of his death. 
when he rose and he said, touch me and see, flesh and bones, he said. He described himself as flesh and bones, not flesh and blood, because his blood was gone, because he'd poured it out on the earth for you, for me. His death is our salvation. No wonder we cry, hallelujah, salvation belongs to our God, because he spilled his blood for us, and why we cleanse ourselves in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for giving us the victory, not because we are worthy, but because you are, not because we've done anything, but because you did. Thanks for giving us the joy of knowing Yeshua, for giving us a reason to shout hallelujah. You are worthy. Praised be you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has done great things. 